Dear Lord, thank you for these lovely ladies who are here to study your word. I pray that you would speak to each one of us tonight, Lord. And also I pray that you would enable many of these dear friends to come to the retreat because I know it's going to be so awesome. So provide for them, provide babysitting, whatever they need, Lord. And we know that you're at work in our lives and we thank you for that. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you know, tonight we're starting Peter's second epistle to the early Christians who were scattered by persecution all throughout the Roman Empire. And whereas his first letter was written to encourage them and give them hope, and this second letter is to warn them of false teaching that was going around. Apparently, there were, there were some false teachers within their fellowships who were contradicting the Old Testament scriptures and the apostles' teaching, and Peter didn't want them to be led astray. Um, you know, the way to protect ourselves from getting off into error is to stay in the Word of God and just keep on growing in our knowledge of the Lord. So Peter opens and closes his letters with this theme of cultivating Christian maturity. The knowledge that Peter talks about is more than intellectual perception. It is experiential knowledge of God based on having a personal relationship with him that results in moral transformation. Um, when we get to chapter 2, Peter gives us a lengthy description of and warning against these false teachers. And then in chapter 3, the last chapter, he emphasizes the second coming of the Lord, which the false teachers were scoffing at. <clears throat> Peter assures his readers that Jesus will indeed come back, and um, knowing that, they and we should be motivated to live godly lives. So 2 Peter is just as applicable to us today as it was in that first century to those early Christians, because like the early church, we too have to counteract worldliness and humanistic philosophy. Um, there are still fa false teachers who deal in half-truths in our churches today, and this letter provides a really clear response to them. So in verse 1, Peter states who this letter is from and who he's writing to. He introduces himself as Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that he uses both his old name, Simon, and the new name, Peter, that Jesus had given him. Uh, you'll recall that when Jesus and his disciples were in Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, still others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' re response is recorded in Matthew 16, 18. He said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So this is when Jesus changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. Um, it's as if Jesus was saying, you're shifting sand now, but I know what I'm going to do in you and what I'm going to accomplish through you, and you are going to be solid rock. Notice, Peter discovered his identity when he understood who Jesus was that he was the Christ, the Messiah, in other words, and the son of the living God. And that's true of us too, isn't it? Um, it's, it's when we realize who Jesus really is and when we receive him as our Savior and our Lord that we understand who we are in relation to God. And life begins to make sense. Colossians 1.16 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. In other words, God doesn't exist for us. He's not, you know, our genie in a bottle to command. Instead, we were made by him and we exist through him and for him. 
when a teenager doesn't understand that God doesn't exist just to give him a girlfriend, <laughs> but instead he exists to please God and fulfill God's purposes for his life, then he'll begin to understand his true identity. Or when a mom understands that she doesn't exist just to change diapers and clean the house and raise children, but she exists for God to fulfill his purposes, then she begins to understand her true identity and her life takes on more meaning. So by identifying himself as Simon, he brings up his old life, who he was before he knew Jesus. And it's good to reflect once in a while on who, you know, and where we'd be if it wasn't for Jesus. And then he uses his new name, Peter, and describes his new identity. He writes that he's a servant and he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated servant is doulos, which means bond servant. In Peter's day, a bond servant was essentially a slave um, to his master for six years, and then at the end of that time, he would be set free. However, if he wanted to remain a bond servant in his master's service for life, then his ear would be pierced, signifying that he was a slave or a bond servant by choice for life. And that's what Peter says here. He's Jesus' bondservant for life by his own choice. Although the doulos was committed to serve his master for life, the master was equally committed to provide for his servant for life. And, you know, who would provide and care for Peter better than Jesus? So, and then Peter also identified himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle means sent one. Jesus had hundreds of followers, but he chose 12 to bring into his inner circle and then send out into ministry, and Peter was one of those. In the second half of verse 1, Peter identifies to who he's writing to. Uh, he says, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received faith as precious as ours. So Peter's not saying, I'm special because I'm an apostle. Um, Instead, he's saying, you have the same precious faith that I do. It's common to all of us who love the Lord. And then he says in verse 2, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and the Jesus our Lord. You know, the more knowledge that you have of Jesus Christ, the more you'll understand that our God is truly a God of grace and peace. The Christian life is all about Jesus um, and the undeserved, unearned favor that he lavishes upon us due to his finished work on the cross. The result in us is peace. Unmistakable, undeniable, unshakable peace because we know we're loved by him and all our sins are forgiven and we have direct access to him through prayer. And after we die, we'll be raised to eternal life with him. So grace and peace go hand in hand. Verse 3 says, his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Notice, everything we need for life and godliness has already been given to us. We already have everything we need. So, you know, we don't have to search through bookstores or infomercials trying to find the seven secrets of effective people or, you know, the way to awaken the giant within this says we've already been given everything we need to live abundantly and to live godly. So how do we grow then? Well, the second half of the verse tells us, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. We grow, in other words, as we get to know the Lord better and better through prayer, through reading his word and studying it, through worshiping him, through serving him, etc. It says he called us by his own glory glory and goodness. That word translated glory literally means weight or heaviness. This is the opposite of cotton candy or mere froth. He's called us to a substantial, meaningful life like his. Our new life in him has weight. It has purpose and meaning and influence, and it's a life of goodness. And verse 4 says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We partake of Jesus' nature 
through these great and precious promises he's given us. For example, promises to never leave us or forsake us, to love us with an everlasting love, to work all things together for good for those who love him, um, and, and finish the good work he started in us, etc. And God always keeps his promises. As the Lord said in Jeremiah 1.12, I am watching over my word to perform it. In other words, God's watching to see that his word is fulfilled. So when God makes a promise, he means it, and we can count on it. May I give you an example from my own life? <clears throat> During the first several years of our marriage, I had all kinds of female problems, many operations, and the doctors really didn't give me any hope of ever having children. But as I was having my devotions this one day, the Lord quickened this promise to my heart. It's in Isaiah 44, verses 3 through 5. It says, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. And that's what I felt like, you know, just dried up. <laughs> and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by the flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. And still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name of Israel. Um, as I was reading those verses, it was like they just jumped off the page at me. And I knew God was speaking to me. And this promise gave me, you know, a lot of hope and faith to not give up. And sure enough, just as this verse speaks of three descendants who will all belong to the Lord, God gave me three wonderful children, two through adoption and one biological child, and they all love the Lord. They're all serving the Lord. The promises in God's word are for us today, just like they were for the Christians in earlier centuries. God's promises are for you. They're meant to give you hope and to help you endure through tough times. So hang on to them, read them, underline them in your Bible, memorize them, and walk by faith that God will fulfill his promises instead of you know, just living by sight and being discouraged by the things that are going around you at present. God's promises are a wonderful resource to keep you on the right path and keep hope alive in your life. God always keeps his word, so cling to his promises and have faith that he will do what he says he will do. Verse 4 says, We partake of his divine nature through the knowledge of him who gave himself for us. As I said, this isn't just intellectual knowledge. It's experiential knowledge. As we fellowship with the Lord and study his word, our knowledge of him grows. And through getting to know him better and through claiming his promises by faith, we're able to escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Evil desires is referring to lust. You know, whether you're talking about sex or money or the need for approval or lust says, I've just got to have more. You know, I want more. But praise God, we're delivered from that mindset through getting to know Jesus and through the promises that he's given us. Verses five through seven say, for this very reason, make every effort, and I'm gonna just pause right there for a moment. Once we're God's spiritual sons and daughters, growth in the Christian life doesn't just happen. We're supposed to give all diligence to our walk with the Lord and make every effort to add these character qualities to our faith. Uh, that's not to say that our efforts save us. Absolutely not. You know, we're saved by grace through faith, period. We've talked about that a lot in here. However, once we are saved, we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and, as he begins to change our character and make us more like Jesus. And that will require some effort on our part. So verses 5 through 7 say, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. So he's talking about working at, at developing these character qualities of Jesus. You know, we start out with faith, um, and it's wonderful that we have faith. But then we need to work diligently to add these other qualities, goodness and knowledge and self-control, etc. When a little baby is born, about all they do is eat and sleep and dirty their diapers, right? <laughs> and that's fine. That's what newborns are meant to do. 
but it, if that's all they do when they're five years old, something's wrong, <laughs> right? Sad to say, some Christians who have known the Lord for several years are still controlled by their lusts and still giving vent to their rage and you know, hurting a lot of people, etc. Some who have been Christians for years and years still aren't feeding themselves. They're waiting for other people to feed them spiritually. So Peter's saying it's time to grow up um, and develop the character qualities of Jesus. And God has given you everything you need to do that. You have faith. Now go for goodness, which means moral excellence. Some of the older translations use the word virtue. This requires getting rid of the junk that we've filled our minds and our spirits with in the past, you know, the racy novels or the off-color videos or whatever, and replacing moral filth with goodness. We can't be good like God is on our own, and he doesn't expect us to, but that's why he's given us the Holy Spirit. Um, as we choose to obey the Holy Spirit's promptings and get rid of the junk in our lives, then the Holy Spirit will cause... Um, goodness and virtue to flow out of our lives as long as that's what we choose. God won't force us to be good, but he will help us change um, if we cooperate with him and if we're willing to work at it. Knowledge refers to practical wisdom, which we obtain by dedicating ourselves to learning God's truth in the scriptures and then putting that truth into action. Self-control means mastering our emotions and our impulses rather than being controlled by them. You know this. <laughs> the false teachers whose views Peter is exposing in this letter believe that knowledge freed people from the need for control of their passions. But Peter says, no, that's wrong. We need to control our passions and our emotions instead of letting them control us. Instead of being ruled by our desire for sex or for food or for drink or for shopping, you know, or gambling or whatever, the Holy Spirit will help us master our cravings and develop self-control. He'll also help us master our emotions so we don't, you know, erupt in anger and, or we aren't eaten up with jealousy or envy or something. It's just so important to develop self-control perseverance is hanging in there and trusting God no matter what comes. The secret to perseverance is knowing that God loves you and he's overseeing all the circumstances in your life. You know, viewing all circumstances as coming from the hand of a loving father who is in control of everything is the secret of perseverance. Although we don't see the end result yet, um, he has promised to work all things together for good if we love him and are called according to his purposes. So that's what we're patiently waiting for. Godliness speaks of the need for Christians to be continually aware of God's presence and live with him in mind. Um, knowing that all our lives are in his hands should influence every aspect of our, of our lives. We should live for him, not just for ourselves. And brotherly kindness um, is very closely linked with godliness. In fact, 1 John 4, 20 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Jesus taught that love involves serving one another and sharing with each other and praying for one another. And then the final thing that Peter says we must add to our faith is love. And love here refers to God's kind of love, which originates not in the one who's loved, but in the one who's loving, comes from God. We love God because he first loved us. God loves us because he is love. Uh, we're to love him because uh, we're God's followers and his Holy Spirit is in us, you know, helping us not only to love him, but to love other people. God's love reaches beyond the Christian community to anyone, anywhere. So God's kind of love seeks the highest good for others, even if it costs us something. Peter says in verse 8 that if we have these qualities in increasing measure, they're going to keep us from living unproductive lives. And then verse 9 he says, but if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. For perhaps he's forgotten, you know, how bad he used to be or she used to be before um, and how much, you know, she needed Jesus cleansing or for perhaps she's forgotten what it cost Jesus so that we could be cleansed and so that we could be saved. 
And then verses 10 through 11 say, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Someone might say, oh, I'm worried. I feel like I'm not progressing. I'm worried I'm gonna lose my salvation. Peter says, no, not if you do these things. If you cooperate with the Holy Spirit, if you're willing to work hard to develop Christ-like character qualities, you're not only going to be fruitful in this life, but you're going to be richly rewarded in eternity. And then verses 12 through 15 say, um, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you have, but I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in uh, the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So Peter knew that he wasn't long for this earth. The Lord had shown him that his time was short. Um, but he wasn't panicked. He, he was at peace about it. He only just wanted to be sure that the believers were on the right track and established in the truth and growing in the Lord before God took him home. Then he continues in verses 16 through 18. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. In other words, um, he's saying, we're not, I'm not espousing theories here. I'm not telling you fables or myths or you know, reading zodiac signs. Peter's saying, I was an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus. I was with the Lord on the mountaintop. I witnessed his transfiguration, you know, when Jesus' deity shone through his humanity. I saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, and I heard God's voice from the clouds saying, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And he says in verse 19, we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. As the world is getting darker, the word of God is shining brighter and brighter. The word translated darker, darker here literally means murky. So Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So the darker and the murkier the world around you becomes, the brighter the word of God will shine so you can see the way to go. So stay in the word. Let it inform you and correct you and direct you and speak to you. And finally, verses 20 and 21 say, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never has its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Enemies of Jesus twisted Old Testament prophecies, giving them personal and bizarre meanings, uh, attempting to exclude Jesus from the fulfillment. Uh, we're gonna get into that in chapter two. But Peter says prophecy is not of any private interpretation. Its meaning is evident and it can be confirmed by other people. Furthermore, it's wrong and it's invalid to twist prophecy to our own personal meaning uh, because prophecy does not come from man, it comes from God. Um, it came through holy men of God, but only as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Remember how Peter wrote about those ancient prophets um, and even angels who longed to look into the meaning of what they were writing, um, th the things they were prophesying? The ancient prophets didn't understand the meaning of what they were writing themselves. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they were seeing and writing things that were going to happen way in the future. Uh, that they didn't understand. But the fulfillment of those prophecies hundreds of years later was absolute proof that their predictions were from God and of no private 
you know, invention. In other words, they weren't just making them up. God was truly speaking to them. Scholars say there are more than 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, these prophecies are specific enough that the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of them, let alone all of them, is staggering. Um, Peter Stoner, who is the chairman of the Departments of Mathematics and Astrology at Pasadena College, was passionate about biblical prophecies. So with 600 students from InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Peter Stoner looked at eight specific prophecies about Jesus, and they came up with extremely conservative probabilities for each of these being fulfilled. And then they considered the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling all eight of those prophecies. The conclusion to his research was staggering. The prospect that anyone would satisfy all eight of those prophecies was just one in 10 to the 17th power. But there are hundreds of Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled to the letter. As Peter says, no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter's saying all this because some of the early Christians were listening to false prophets and false teachers who were bringing destructive heresies into the church. We're going to talk about that next time when we get into chapter 2. So let's close in prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for this passage that encourages us to make every effort to grow in our character and become more and more like you. Thank you so much that you've given everything we need to do that. Thank you for your word. We're so blessed to have the whole Bible now, the Old and New Testament. And thank you for your Holy Spirit who's right inside of us, nudging us to do your will, convicting us when we do wrong. Thank you, Lord. Help us not to get discouraged and give up. Help us to just keep walking by faith and not by sight. We love you so much. We thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.